let's thank Patrick and the New Thing team for all that they're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Guys. Must have done. <laughs> How many of us have had that happen before? <laughs> right? You went in for a handshake and they just totally left you hanging. Right? Or like maybe you went in for a high five and then they gave you the fist bump and you ended up with like that weird turkey situation, right? Or like, how about you, you go in for a hug and you realize halfway through the person's like really not into this hug and you're like, oh, so sorry. I remember years ago, uh, I was meeting someone for the first time. I was really excited to meet him. I saw him from down the hallway, so I, I kind of started running towards him, which is already a bad idea. And I go for this like really excitable handshake, but I totally miss his arm entirely and I poke him in the belly. <laughs> and I like, I have expected him to make like a doughboy no noise, like <laughs> he, didn't, he, he didn't do any of that. Uh, now some of us aren't all that phased by those weird physical interactions. That stuff is totally okay and in your comfort zone. Like just quick show of hands, how many of you are huggers, not fighters, right? Like that's, that is easy peasy for you. But others of you though, the thought of like a big old bear hug is terrifying, isn't it? Like anyone wanna just give me a bit? Yeah, I can see from your horrified looks, like please don't choose me. Now, this may be because you didn't grow up around uh, affectionate parents or maybe that was the culture you were raised in or maybe honestly you're just a germaphobe. Any germaphobes in the house today? You're just like stay away from me. That was always sort of surprising to me when churches would have those like sanitation stations like, what does that communicate to brand new people in our church? Like, hi, nice to meet you, but real quick, <laughs> just pour that over me and uh, make sure we're sanitized. Now, before I go any further, though, I, I do wanna pause and talk about um, what we're not referencing today. We're not talking about unwanted or uninvited physical touch. B believe it or not, uh, we wrote this message uh, well before the news cycle this week. Unwanted, uninvited physical touch is never, ever okay. What we're talking about today is like a hug, a handshake, a pat on the back from people that we know and love. So how important is this stuff? How important are handshakes and hugs and high fives? In this series, we've been unpacking what it means to really Love. We know that love is not just a dopamine rush to the brain. It's not just a feeling of emotion. In fact, one of Jesus' closest friends, John, puts it this way. He says that God is love. That God's very nature, ontologically, he is love. Not just that he knows about love or can point us in the direction of love, but that he is himself love. And in the person of Jesus, we see something fascinating. And it's that love does. It's active. It's intentional. It moves out of the rows, out of comfort zones. And Jesus is always modeling this. Whether it's a massive crowd or his closest friends, Jesus is always drawing near. And in uh, Christian doctrine, we actually call this the incarnation, that he came near to us so that we might know God, Jesus is always showing us that love does. It embraces. But for some of us, like the idea of physical contact at all is really, really awkward. It's really uncomfortable. But a team of researchers found that on average, we touch our cell phone 2,400 times. Some of you are touching yours right now. Um, so it's actually a heavy user touches their smartphone something like 5,400 times. I've reached for mine twice since I've been up here. Uh, our sense of touch is alive and well. And isn't it strange that while we may touch our cell phone thousands of times, often the very people that we're texting, we have difficulty expressing ourselves with a hug or a handshake or a high five. There's this Berkeley professor named uh, Dr. Keltner, who refers to the US as a touch-deprived culture. A touch-deprived culture. And he describes a study that they did where they observed two friends sitting in a cafe in various parts of the world, and they uh, measured and recorded how many times those two friends touched each other. In England, the two friends didn't touch each other once, at all. In the US, they touch each other 
twice, like at a burst of excitement, like if someone scored a goal or something like that. And then they measured two friends in Puerto Rico. Do you wanna know how many times they touched each other at the cafe in Puerto Rico? 180 times. Now, some of you are like making a mental note like canceled trip to Puerto Rico. <laughs> like 180, to me honestly, seems like a bit much. I don't know how many times a high five came up in the conversation. But it does show something interesting. It shows how culture influences the way that we understand physical touch. So why are we so bad at this? <laughs> why are we so bad at expressing this physical touch in healthy ways to one another, and yet we can't help but pinch the cheeks of a baby, right? I've seen you all, we all do it. Or how about like a puppy? I picked up so many strangers' dogs without them asking, I have a problem. I don't know what's wrong with me. We're just fine like pinching the cheeks and picking up a puppy, but when it's expressing healthy physical touch to our friends and family, many of us can be incredibly touch averse. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning thinking, why does this even matter? Why are we even talking about this? It matters because you and I are integrated unities of mind, body, spirit. We are created that way. Our bodies are not inconsequential, and God has given us bodies to love and bless the world we're in. It matters because many of us experience what sociologists are now calling crowded loneliness. Anyone know what I'm talking about? You can be around dozens, even hundreds of people and still feel totally alone. It can happen at home, it can happen at school, it can happen at a party, it can even happen here in this room. You're with people, right? We're in the same space, and yet we feel so isolated. Anyone tracking with me? That feeling of isolation can be so crushing. We're physically together, but emotionally disconnected. Could it be that one reason for that is our lack of healthy physical touch? In fact, scientists are learning more and more about the significance of physical touch. When you touch someone, it activates the orbital frontal cortex, the part of the brain that controls compassion. Do you know that there are actually neurons in our skin that tell our brain what emotion is being expressed through touch? My brother Travis, actually growing up homeschooled, was so severely dyslexic, uh, my parents couldn't figure out how to kind of crack the code of his brain until my mom decided to get a tray and fill it with sand so that Travis could actually feel the letters through his fingertips and it just unlocked his brain and now he's learning like his fourth language. The sense of physical touch is massively significant. Professor Keltner tells of another study uh, that demonstrated this, and for some of us, this study sounds like maybe a bit of a nightmare. They had a wall, and they cut a hole out in the wall, and they had uh, person one stick their arm through the wall, and person two had to communicate an emotion through a one-second touch to the arm. How many of you would sign up for that test? Like, never, right? <laughs> Just, here's the armhole wall. <sighs> Have fun. Get this though. 60% of the time, the first person correctly identified the emotion on the first guess. 60% of the time, that person was able to identify through a one second touch the emotion that was being communicated. Now, Kelter did note two gender specific differences in this study that are, I think are worth mentioning. Number one, when the man tried to communicate compassion to the woman, she got zero right, <laughs> zero. And when a woman tried to communicate anger to the man, guess what? He also got zero right. He had no idea what to do, so uh, good luck. <laughs> now Jesus was often encountering people who no doubt experienced this sort of crowded Loneliness, And in Matthew chapter eight, he's just finished uh, one of his most famous teachings called the Sermon on the Mount. And this is how chapter eight begins here. It says, when he came down from the mountainside, 
large crowds followed him. So this was becoming a pretty regular occurrence for Jesus. People were hearing of his teachings and healings, and so the crowds are getting larger and larger and larger. So, so picture this for a moment. He's coming down this hill, and there's people of every age, every language, every region and tribe, and then right in the middle of this massive crowd, look at what happens in verse two. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now don't miss this. Leprosy was used to describe a whole slew of contagious skin diseases. In fact, just touching someone with leprosy could instantly infect you. It was a death sentence in most cases, especially in Bible times. A cure was hundreds of years away, and it would often result in disfigurement and usually death. This is not a rash. This is not an inconvenience. This was a death sentence. But as bad as the physical effects were, I would argue that the social effects were just as bad, if not worse. In the ancient Near East, a, a person with leprosy was declared unclean, ceremonially unclean. They were cast out of the city. They were banished from the community. They were made to live physically outside the city gates. They couldn't worship in the synagogue. They had to wear torn clothing. They even had to cover their face. And any time they came within 50 yards of another person, they had to shout at the top of their lungs, unclean, unclean, unclean. To put that into context, from where I'm standing to the back of the auditorium is 30 yards. Like try ordering from the cafe 50 yards away. And imagine you're this person who's for years, maybe decades, had to tear your clothing, live outside the city gates, and literally shout, unclean. Back away. You don't want to get near to me. They were quarantined from the rest of the population. They were stigmatized and outcasts. For families were torn apart. Lives were broken with despair and heartache, and they had next to no interaction with anyone. In fact, I would venture to guess that many of them probably wondered, has God abandoned me? How could he let this happen? And perhaps some of us have felt that same way this morning. Perhaps you've prayed that prayer, God, where are you? Maybe you've been the victim of being stigmatized and outcast. Maybe it was a really messy divorce and the people you thought were your friends turned their back on you. Maybe you're the child of an alcoholic and your family has carried that reputation for years. I would bet that in a room this size, every single one of us has felt at some level what it's like to be a social leper, to be cast aside, to wonder, has God abandoned me? And yet, right here, right in the middle of this large crowd, this leper is kneeling in the dirt before Jesus. Imagine what the crowd might have been doing. As he's forcing his way through the crowd, people probably sneered. Maybe some people actually gasped. I bet you there were people that were probably trying to keep him from getting to Jesus, but he falls at the feet of Jesus and he asks for healing. And did you notice what he says? He says, Lord, if you are, what's the word? Willing. He doesn't say if you're able. Jesus, if you have the capacity to, if you have the talent, he says, are, are you willing? As if to say, I know you're able. I know that you can do this, but does your grace and compassion extend even to someone like me? And maybe you felt that way too. Could God love someone even like me? With all that I've done, with all that I've been told that I am, would God love even me? Imagine this man's pain as he kneels before Jesus. And how does Jesus respond in verse three? I love this. It says, Jesus reached out his hand and what's it say? Touched the man. He touches this leper, can you imagine the gravity of what it would be like to be near Jesus or this leper as this is happening? 
Can you imagine the gasps of the crap? No one's even dared come near this guy. And Jesus looks him right in the eyes, gets down low, and then touches him. All of a sudden, maybe for the first time in this guy's life, he knew that he was accepted at least by someone. If you've ever been an outcast, you know the feeling of finally being accepted by someone you thought could never love you. And here's Jesus stooping down, and this is what he says. He says, I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately he was cured of his leprosy. So, so why does Jesus do this? Why, did, why touch him first? Why not heal him first and then touch him, right? That would have been a whole lot safer, probably healthier, certainly more sanitary. In fact, just a few verses later, there's, a, there's an interaction between a Roman soldier and Jesus who asks Jesus to heal the soldier's servant, and Jesus doesn't even go to the man's house. He says he's healed. So clearly just, Jesus doesn't need to touch him. Why, why not just like from a distance like laser miracle fingers, right? Like, pew, you're cured. <laughs> Full disclosure, that's what I would do. That'd be awesome. Jesus stoops down and he touches him. Why? Why risk it? Because love does. Love draws near. Love embraces. Love comes close. Michelangelo put it this way. He said, to touch is to give life. To touch is to give life. Do we see that in this story? Jesus isn't simply healing a skin disease. He's giving him back his life. Life. Those are profoundly different things. And then he goes on in verse four. He says, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. So the scholars have all sorts of guesses as to why Jesus did this, but here's why I think he did. Jesus knows this man's just been healed and his likely impulse is to jump for joy, click his heels like a leprechaun and then go run and tell his family and friends, right? This is a big day. This is big news. But what does Jesus say to do first? He says, go to the community that you have been an outcast from. He says, offer your sacrifice, why? So that you'll be restored to your place of worship. You'll be welcomed back to your community. He'll get his life back. That's what love does. It doesn't sit at the sidelines. It doesn't avoid hurt. It doesn't step back when things are messy. It walks right into it. It locks eyes with the outcast and the heartbroken and said, you matter. I accept you. You're welcome here. We can get through this. That's what love does. So how, how do we do this then in our touch-deprived culture? I think there are a couple of things that we can do. First off, I think we would do well to remember that we're all fighting a battle that no one else sees. Maybe even this morning, you walked in through those doors with a smile on your face, but a devastated heart. Maybe it's been a tough weekend, or week, or month, or year, or decade. All of us carry struggles and burdens that maybe we've never told a soul, all of us. I think we would do well to remember that that we're all carrying baggage. We've all felt alone. And sometimes it's those big things that really make us feel alone, but isn't it often those little tiny things that slowly chip away at us? When I graduated high school, I actually uh, led worship at a little church in Detroit, and uh, it was nothing to write home about. I sing like a drummer, so that's not usually good, unless you're in Hanson. Um, <laughs> but there's this little 
beautiful community in the heart of the city and she had like a little beat up guitar and I would sing and sing and sing. I like played so hard, my fingers would bleed sometimes what the kids thought was awesome. But it was also really lonely. I didn't know what I was doing. I often felt like a failure. If I didn't get an encouraging word or some sort, it was really crushing. But there was this woman at this church, this older woman, who was about a foot and a half tall, and she had named herself Sugar Mama. (laughs) And every single Sunday, the very first moment I saw her, she would throw her arms open. She goes, "Mm, come give Sugar Mama some sugar. (laughs) And she would give just the biggest, most beautiful bear hug. And that may seem like a dumb example, but I'll tell you what, there were Sundays where I didn't think I was gonna make it through. There were Sundays where I sat in my car before driving saying, can I, can I do this one more time? I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not talented enough, I feel so alone. And when this woman would hug me, she didn't say anything after that. She went on to go hug someone else. But in that moment, it was a reminder that God was present in this place, in this moment, in this interaction. We all have these opportunities every single day to love and care for people in small ways, people who are carrying pain and guilt and shame. And they may be asking what the leper asked. Are you willing? Are you you willing to see me for who I actually am? Are you willing to spite the mess that is my life, the chaos that is this current moment? Are you willing to still look me in the eye and show me that you care about who I am despite all my screw ups, despite all my shortcomings, despite all my scars and wounds and garbage and baggage? Are you willing? And I think people ask us this every single day in various different ways. Are you willing to draw near? Are you willing to help heal my hurt? Are you willing to share this burden with me? It, it might be a student that's going through a tough season. It could be a neighbor that just honestly doesn't have a lot of friends. It might be someone you live with right now. A spouse, a kid, a roommate, what would it look like to draw near to them? Because love is not distant. It's not just simply shouting from the sidelines. It comes near, it draws close, it looks in the eyes, it hugs and embraces and says, we're going to get through this. What, what if we became known as a people that intentionally drew near? What if we declared together today, I'm willing not because of how great I am, but because Jesus first drew near to me. We love because he first loved us. What a miracle that is. When we draw near, we become the hands of Jesus, reaching out to heal the hurt. Today, leprosy is healable, it's curable. But I would guess there are people in our lives that feel like social lepers, and maybe they have leprosy of the heart, of the soul, of the mind. Will we draw near? Because closeness is a type of healing in and of itself. So will we embrace? Will we draw near? Will we love with our lives? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that the very essence of the gospel, of the good news, is that you didn't wait on the sidelines. You stepped down from infinity into humanity to love us, to save us, and to serve as a sacrifice, God. Whether you're washing the feet of your disciples or touching the head of a leper, God, you have shown us that love does, that it moves, that it is active and intentional. May it be so of us. May we love not just with our Sundays, but with our whole lives. Give us courage 
to either ask, are you willing, or hear the question said to us, and to love as you have loved us. Help us to be a blessing wherever we go. We thank you, and we love you. We pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.